Welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Catherine McLean, a tobacco control researcher at Temple University. TOPS is being organized by myself, C. Shang from The Ohio State University, Mike Pesco from Georgia State University, and Justin White from the University of California, San Francisco. The seminar will, will be one hour with questions asked by the moderator and discussant. The audience may pose questions and comments in a Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable comments. Please keep the comments professional and related to the research being discussed. Comments meeting seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they are not read aloud. Your comments are very much appreciated. The presentation is being video recorded and will be made available on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org, I will turn the presentation over to today's moderator, C. Shang from The Ohio State University, to introduce our speaker. Today, Dr. John Buckle will lead a single paper presentation entitled Harm Reduction for Smokers Who Do Not Want to Quit, Using Tobacco Policy to Encourage Switching to E-Cigarettes. Dr. Buckle is a senior researcher at the University of Oxford, with a joint appointment at the Health Economics Research Center in the Nuffield Department of Population Health and the Biomedical Research Center in Nuffield Department of Primary Healthcare Sciences. His work is behavioral research in subject areas including tobacco, obesity, and genomics. He uses experimental and econometric approaches to answer research questions. Our discussion today is Mike Pascal. Uh, Dr. Balco will be presenting his research in three segments. We will have pauses after each segment to allow for questions. Dr. Balco, thank you for presenting for us today. Uh, the floor is yours, John. Great. Yes. Thank you very much, C. Um, well, thank you all very much for, for letting me uh, have the opportunity to speak. It's very nice to, to be here. Um, so today's paper is, is uh, as C said, it's about harm reduction for smokers who are not interested in quitting and whether or not we can encourage them to, uh, to switch to e-cigarettes. Um, so this is a paper with some uh, co-authors of mine. So um, Jody, uh, Lisa, and Suchitra, uh, Suchitra and Stephanie at Yale, and uh, Paul Aviard here, here at Oxford with me as well. So let me move the slides on. There we go. Um, just to acknowledge, uh, so this um, work is funded by the FDA through the uh, Yale Center for uh, Tobacco Product Use and Addiction. So very grateful to our funders. Um, and just by way of disclosure, there's no um, industry funding that, that uh, I would like to declare. Um, so just as a brief overview, we're going to go through the sections of the paper as we go through the talk today. So start with the introduction and the background, uh, the methods, results, and finish off with the discuss uh, discussion. Um, and as Steve said, we'll stop um, at various sections for some, some brief interludes and questions along our way. So, introduction background. So, the basic problem we're facing with here is that around 30% of smokers are not interested in quitting. Um, and that, as a proportion of the total number of smokers, is growing or has been growing over time. Um, this is a problem or a further problem because these smokers tend to be older and they tend to smoke heavily. And in turn, that means that the uh, harms that they're at risk to are higher. Um, so, really, we need to do what we can here to help. Um, prevent some of the issues of the uh, disease and, and, and uh, delay the onset of, of, of premature death associated with smoking. Um, so how can we help them to quit? Well, we can use cessation treatments that are available, so things like um, you know, clinical med uh, medicines that are available, or NRT or counselling, um, but typically uh, they're only available to those that are interested in quitting. Of course, we're interested in those that aren't interested in quitting here today. Um, policies, of course, have had some impact over time, so things like taxes, um, public health campaigns, uh, banning of smoking in workplaces, all of those things. Um, and again, we've got the proliferation of things like self-help tools, so books or apps or, you know, sort of modern trend towards healthy living. Um, and yet, and yet, despite all of these wonderful things that are helping smokers to quit smoking, we're still seeing this really high proportion of smokers that are not interested in quitting. So perhaps a different tactic um, is, well, if we can't encourage them to quit, can we encourage a strategy of harm reduction through switching to alternative products? One of those being, obviously, e-cigarettes. Um, so there's emerging evidence from um, randomized controlled trials suggesting that e-cigarettes are appealing to, to some of these smokers, which is good. Um, those have found that cigarettes, so first generation e-cigarettes, tend to be more appealing. Um, uh, but, the, but, the, but the nicotine delivery 
uh, in those products can be can be quite slow compared to, to compared to cigarettes and perhaps not quite so appealing. Um, and some of the uh, second generation e-cigarettes we have can be these kind of big and bulky devices that aren't necessarily appealing to everybody. Um, so kind of a, a question that kind of follows from that is, well, what about sort of modern pod e-cigarettes? Well, what do we mean? First of all, what do we mean by pod e-cigarettes? So things like things like Juul. Um, and we think that possibly these might have appeal to NIQ smokers for two reasons. First of all, um, mo for most of these products, they're using salt-based versus free-based nicotine. And the key there is that with the salt-based nicotine, the nicotine delivery is much more rapid than it is in the, in the, in the free base. And this graph on the right here is showing that. So the top line is the nicotine delivery profile over time of cigarettes. Uh, the group at the bottom is the nicotine delivery profile of, of sort of uh, free based nicotine. And that sort of line in the middle is that of, of the salt based nicotine, which is, which is common in, in these pod based nicotine. So can they pack a bigger punch than the uh, first generation cigarettes in terms of nicotine delivery? And therefore, are they more appealing to, to smokers that don't quit? And the second reason is, well, they tend to be these sort of small light. Um, devices that were common with the first generation of cigarettes they're more like a cigarette that the, that the smokers use than the kind of bulky and heavier devices so again do they have this additional appeal that might um, help encourage them to switch away from cigarettes so from this kind of pulling it together and, and setting out some broad research questions so first um, what are these smokers uh, relative preferences for their own cigarettes versus uh, the first generation disposable e-cigarettes and the pod uh, based e-cigarettes as well second of all can fda control attributes so we talk about nicotine flavors and health harms um, can they be used to encourage these smokers that don't want to quit away from their own cigarettes and thirdly how do the behaviors vary across individual characteristics so are more uh, certain types of NRQC smokers more or less responsive to some of the uh, attributes and therefore some of the policies that the FDA might implement to try to encourage them away from their cigarettes. Okay, Mike, did we want to have a break at this point? Um, um, uh, yeah, no, no questions from my end uh, yet. Okay, we can, yeah, crack on with the methods and, and rally back at that point. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so let's move to the uh, move along to the methods. So, how are we going to answer our research questions? Well, we're going to use a combination of uh, an online survey with a discrete choice experiment. So, the discrete choice experiment is our main um, sort of uh, weapon of choice, but we're going to complement that with data from the from the survey. So, why a DCE? Because and we can obtain data about the trade-offs um, and preferences that are perhaps unobtainable elsewhere. Um, and we can analyze preferences beyond current consumption. So I can't learn much, for example, about uh, what menthol smokers think about flavors in e-cigarettes if I just look at the behavior of menthol smokers, uh, whereas I can with an, uh, an experimental setting, or perhaps more so. Um, and why an online survey? Well, we can get large and uh, nationally representative samples of, of the smokers that we want to. Uh, I don't have to wait very long for the data, which is really good. Um, we can ask specific questions to get the exact data that we want, um, and we can record behaviours um, of the smokers and we can use those in our, our choice models with the experimental data that we collect. Um, so why, and again, why both together? Because we combine data that we collect from the experiment with data we collect in the survey and use that to, to analyse and understand the behaviour a bit more. So let's look about um, the DCE a bit more in particular and, and uh, by way of motivation, just kind of go over a few of its, its features and some points. Well, some of the I guess some of the reasons we use these techniques, um, first of all, we can predict the impact of policies before they're implemented. And that's really useful from a policy making point of view. If you have several policies or combinations of policies that you might implement and you want to work out which ones are best to, to um, uh, support your interests. Um, then we can, again, examine key trade offs between the attributes of the product. And again, that's really in, uh, useful for policy. So is it is it prices or is it flavours or is it health harms that are really important to smokers and, and therefore which are, are those smokers going to re respond more or less to those policies. Uh, we can incorporate external data into our analyses. So data we collect in the survey but also things like you know existing policies, data perhaps from national, nationally collected data sets like PATH or NHIS or NHANES. Um, we can recover causal effects of attributes on choices. Now, 
I'll put a star there because I want to be quite specific about what I mean. Um, and what I mean is we can recover uh, uh, the causal effects of uh, attribute level variation in the experiment on experimental choices. That's not the same thing as what else is understood sometimes as a causal effect because we have a big, potentially a big gap between what people tell us they're going to do in an experiment and what they do in real life. So we have to bear that in mind. But nonetheless, I could get nice, clean estimates within the realms of my experiment. Uh, and finally, these, these uh, types of studies are kind of well suited to tobacco. So, um, so Dan McFadden, who's a um, Nobel Prize laureate in economics, um, has a couple of textbook chapters where he kind of makes the point that these studies are, are quite good when um, individuals are familiar with the, spot, uh, with the products, when they're um, well described by their attributes. Um, and I think in the case of, of tobacco products to smokers, we're, we're broadly speaking in keeping with that. Um, and then Matt Quaif and others have a paper, um, 2018, where they look at um, sort of health DCEs um, in cases where they've given people uh, these choices in experiments, and then they've followed them up to see if they make those choices when presented with the same choice in real life. And they find about an 80% correspondence between what people say they'll do in these experimental settings and what they'll do in real life. So again, it supports the idea that these are um, uh, useful and valid, valid methods of what we're doing. Other reasons why... DCEs are quite useful. Um, again, like a survey, we can, we can go and collect up-to-date data. Relatively inexpensive compared to several other study designs. Again, easy to administer relative to other study designs. For example, a clinical trial is much more um, intensive. Um, data that may not be available elsewhere. So it might not be collected in, in national surveys like NHIS or NHANES or other ones like that. Um, and finally, um, there's been quite a good evolution in choice models over the last 20 years or so, where we can get really um, now quite rich behavioural information that we, we see um, in our experiment and, and from other sources as well. And we'll, and we'll talk about, a bit, we'll elaborate on that a little bit more as, as we go through. So sadly, um, choice experiments like any study design come with a um, set of limitations as well. So. First of all, they're what we call hypothetical bias. So um, what smokers tell us they're going to do in an experiment is not necessarily what they're going to go and do in real life. Uh, it might be underreporting or misreporting of some of their behaviours. So in terms of things in um, social stigma or kind of social desirability um, bias, we might sort of underreport some of these, these um, uh, sort of addictive behaviours. And, uh, and we see some of that in other areas as well, for example, um, the Handbook of Health Economics, um, Corley and Room have a, uh, a, a chapter where they, you know, see under-reporting of things like alcohol in surveys and smoking in surveys as well, so it's quite uh, common. Uh, gaming, so individuals in surveys might uh, respond in ways that they think are best for themselves rather than, say, the public interest. Um, the sample sizes are often small, so again, typically in these studies we only need several hundred observations to, to kind of power our analyses. Um, but actually, if we're trying to make inferences about whole populations, then sometimes that can be quite limiting. Um, sampling issues as well, so things like selection bias. Um, so our sample, for example, is collected on an online survey. Well, is there something systematically different about smokers that answer uh, surveys on online settings to smokers uh, from the general population? I don't know, but possibly. So we might be subject to these kind of biases that are unobserved to us. Um, and finally, there is quite a lot of sort of technical knowledge that goes into both the kind of the design and modeling of these experiments as well. So it could be a kind of barrier to, to, to using them as well. So yeah, so we should bear these in mind when we're, when we're sort of evaluating uh, these, uh, the evidence that we get from these. Okay, so in our online survey, um, we collected kind of several different kinds of data. So first of all, um, whether or not individuals wanted to quit, which of course we need to make sure we're sampling white people. Um, Sociodemographics, uh, a bunch of questions on um, smoking and cessation his, uh, history, um, and some COVID related questions, which we're kind of um, going to deal with in, in part of the model um, here. And I think that's kind of um, important given um, you know, recent events. Um, so, in terms of the sample itself, so we collected uh, information from uh, 2000 uh, NIQC smokers uh, using an online platform, we use Qualtrics. Uh, individuals were aged between 35 and 85. They were, of course, not interested in quitting. And we defined that. So we used a variable uh, that we took from the PATH survey that was from a scale of 0 to 10, how interested in you are quitting. 
Uh, we defined a, someone that was interested in quitting as having a score of five or lower on that scale. Uh, we used, um, it was it administered uh, either through smartphones or, or PC. Um, with majority, I think about 60% of people answering on the smartphone. Uh, and quotas we used, again, from PATH, uh, we, we uh, used quotas to um, sample so that we had a uh, sample that was representative uh, in terms of um, age, uh, gender, ethnicity, and education. Um, yeah. And, yeah, and just as kind of note, we, we set out to collect people whose responses were five or less on the scale of interested in quitting, but actually we, we struggled to collect the last uh, I think sort of five or six percent of the sample. So then we had to relax that. So we had a few people whose interest in quitting is between five and eight on a scale of zero to ten. Um, and I'll talk about exactly how many people that was and some robustness checks that we did on that as we go through later on. Okay, so let's talk about the experiment design. So in our experiment, we um, asked individuals to choose between three products. So these are listed at the top. So we have the pod e-cigarette. We had the Sigalite e-cigarette uh, and we had their own, your own cigarette. And that was what we call the opt-out. So we wanted to frame the whole experiment around these smokers' own cigarettes rather than just a generic cigarette. And then we described those products in terms of five attributes. So and those are listed on the left. So whether or not an e-cigarette helps you quit cigarettes, whether an e-cigarette is healthier than a cigarette, um, the flavours of the e-cigarette, um, the amount of nicotine per puff or per vape relative to your own cigarette um, and the marginal price of the the e-cigarettes as well. Um, we allowed those to vary according to the levels that you can see there. So for the first two attributes, it's, it's quite simple, yes or no. Uh, for the flavours, it's tobacco, menthol, meat, fruit and sweet, as they were the most common uh, e-cigarette flavours around on the market. Uh, nicotine per puff, again, no nicotine, less than your usual nicotine, uh, your cigarette, the same as your usual cigarette, and more than your usual cigarette. Um, and then the marginal price, just to reflect the, the marginal price of either um, a pod refill um, or a, a cigarette like um, disposable cigarette. Um, and then for uh, the uh, respondent's own cigarette, of course, it's, you know, whatever it is that they, they pay for a cigarette in general or the, or the, the flavour that they use in their, in their regular cigarette. Okay, so when we have the experimental design, we want to sort of use that in our choice tasks. And so from that design, we, we develop these choice tasks. So again, this is what individuals saw and what um, they were asked to choose from. So again, we have our products at the top and our attributes on the left. And then in the cells um, for the e-cigarettes, we were gonna vary these for each of the choices um, according to our or, or given the levels of our, our experimental design. So, um, yeah, that's, yeah. Um, so, uh, in terms of designing uh, these choice scenarios, um, there are, there's a basic problem of having way too many combinations of attributes and levels that you could give individuals. And uh, in order that everybody would answer every single combination, you'd have millions of choice tasks that people would need to answer. And obviously that's impractical because people get tired and only really have a limited amount of time to think. So we have to find a way of giving people um, as few choice tasks to do as we can, at the same time as maximizing the, the behavioral information we get from that. And that process is called um, uh, just your experimental design. And there are several ways of doing that. Um, in this case, we've used what we call an efficient design. Um, and that's a, what we call a, a Bayesian de-optimal one. And, and what we've done there, or what that means, is that we've gone and done a pilot study just on a basic design, and then we've used that pilot study to uh, update our normal design, hence the Bayesian, and then reran that design based on the pilot study, um, and then collected our data for the full sample based on that. So instead of giving people hundreds or thousands or millions of choice tasks, we designed our study to have 24 and then we split that out into two blocks and we randomly allocated people to either of those two blocks so they only had to answer 12 choice sets each so that's helping keep the what we call the cognitive burden down for them uh, and we gave them a practice scenario as well to help them sort of, um, understand the tasks as well before they started on the experiment uh, in full okay so once we have 
our experimental data, um, we then move to, to modeling that data. So broadly speaking, we take the experimental choices of cigarettes or e-cigarettes, and they, they're our dependent variable. And then we regress those on the attributes and levels that we used in the, the experiment. And then we're able to see through the way that we varied the attributes and levels, how those attributes and levels impacted on smokers' choices. So that's broadly speaking what we're doing here. Um, we, um, it, uh, to sort of, I guess, uh, get at two things we were really interested in doing. We extended the model in two ways that we're interested in. So first of all, we use latent classes. And second of all, we use a latent variable. And I'm gonna explain what I mean by both of those and put a bit more meat on those bones in the next few slides. Um, but, but, but essentially, uh, we used our experimental data and uh, information that we collected in the survey to try to understand choices as best we can. That's what we're doing here. Um, do you mind taking some Q and A's uh, before going into the details of the modeling? Yeah, sure. I'm happy to. Yeah. So uh, there are several clarifi clarification questions in the Q&A. So one is uh, during the choice trials, what is the prompt given to the participants? For example, which do you prefer? So what exactly was the question asked to the participants? Oh, just, yeah, just choose your preferred option so that you'd have at the bottom, you'd have a, a sort of tick box option to choose um, the poly cigarette, the disposable or their own, own cigarette. Okay, uh, so other questions are regarding how you pick the attributes. Uh, there is a question from Duncan Cole. Uh, whether an e-cigarette is healthier than cigarette seems more like a consumer belief than a product attribute. How can the, can the FDA create this attribute? So just, uh, I guess, some rationale about the choices of attributes. And there is an, also a related to the question regarding you know, um, how people may view the alternatives given the flavors, nicotine levels, uh, and also other features like accessibility uh, and affordability, for example, prices and taxes. So I guess, you know, just a general comment and of how the um, attributes and their levels are picked. Yeah, so again, just, well, broadly speaking, flavors was to, to get as, as a broad coverage as the, of the market as we, we could get. So fruit and sweet, I think, are the most common types of flavor out there on the market. Now, you might pick more specific flavors, like, for example, strawberry or peach. But in doing that, then you're eliciting quite specific preferences for those. Um, and again, you don't want to have so many options that it, you would just be confused by how many of them there are, if that makes sense. So it's trying to strike a balance between the, the amount of options that you can give uh, and being general enough to, to sort of cover um, as many options as you can, if that makes sense. Uh, Don, that's a really good question. You are, yeah, absolutely right. Um, yeah, so I guess in part, perception is going to play a role here. I think that um, this is trying to elicit whether or not these smokers find whether or not it's healthy uh, as, as an appealing feature of these products. But you're right, that will be absolutely conditional on their risk perceptions of those. But I think from a policy point of view, it's more about, well, um, can this inform things like public health messaging in NIQ smoking population? So actually, if it was an appealing feature on average in this population, can you encourage switching by sort of um, trumpeting those, those messages as well? And I think that's the idea here, but I'm happy to have discuss that further and, and yeah. Um, um, what was the other one? See prices or? Uh, yeah, I guess you, you, you responded already. So I, I think there is a follow-up question to the question asked to participants by Cassie D. White. So she asked, do you think we are missing out on important information by simply asking which do you prefer with no contextual information? Um, and she's interested in seeing whether the instruction set can change the evaluation of products or expression of preferences in DCE. And we'll be curious to see if you think that's valuable. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I think a lot of the way that it's framed and modeled is going to have some bearing on your, on your choices, I think. Um, 
Yeah, and, and actually, you know, a, a good question is if we had used, say, a different set of attributes with realistic different, different products or different product choices, uh, to some extent, probably yes, but I, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, so, but one thing we do do is try to build in various forms of, of realism in these experiments. So one is obviously trying to sort of frame the whole experiment around the smoker's own cigarette choice, because that's something they know very clearly. Uh, that we can then use information on the smoker's own product use uh, in analyses as well. So whether or not they're a menthol smoker and the price they normally pay. And you'll see when we get to the models that actually we, we take the price they usually pay um, and then model whether e-cigarettes were cheaper or more expensive than the, the product they pay. We can also use um, market data in our predictions. So instead of using the uh, data that we provided in the experiment to make predictions, we can embed mar uh, um, data from the real world into, into our model of, of market predictions. And I'll talk a bit about that later as well, another way to do it. Um, then you can also use other, other information in the survey as well. So for example, we know how many, or we asked the smokers whether or not they used e-cigarettes. So then when we come to modeling the data, we can um, adjust our models so that they, uh, our baseline, they, they predict what the smokers told us that they, they used. Um, yeah, so we can adjust our, our, our shares for that as well. So there's several different ways that we can try to kind of get over the fact that we are living in an experimental setting by embedding uh, uh, data that we can collect from, and, and data we can retrieve from the real world. But yeah, but no, yeah, not a perfect science, sadly, by, by any, 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 any wild stretch of the imagination. Thank you. Uh, we can save all the other questions at the end. Uh, so. let, let me let me jump in if that's okay. See you with uh, with a couple. Um, uh, John, um, what is the data source that you're using uh, then for your discrete trace experiment? And are there any known kind of issues with the the data source? So, um, uh, so do you mean who's the, who's the data collector, or who are you going through to collect your DC information? Oh, uh, yeah, Qualtrics. So they yeah, so they okay. start, yeah, stop individual tours. Um, I, I mean, we've had uh, you know a. We've done a few of the experiments with Qualtrics. We've had, uh, you know, they've been perfectly reasonable to work with. I, I don't know whether there are any flaws. I, I dare take a view as, you know, I don't want to get sued. So um, I don't, I mean, they, yeah, seem to us to be perfectly reasonable. Like I'm asking for a sample and they collect it, so. And so just to understand, uh, just maybe it'll help to understand kind of the variation then. So you have 2000 respondents and I was curious, what percent of those uh, choose their usual cigarettes every time? And what percent choose an e-cigarette every time? And I guess kind of the remaining are giving you variation across the products depending on attributes. So that's actually you're identifying, the subjects contributing, I believe, identifying variation in that case then, right? Exactly, yeah. Uh, off the top of my head, uh, I don't know. And I'm, I'm uh, yeah, not going to sort of take a stab. But, but, but what we do see is you'll see in the, in the latent class model that we, we essentially um, pull apart individuals that stuck to their own cigarettes versus those that, that switch between yeah, cigarettes and e-cigarettes. So, okay. uh, but yeah, and certainly that's a good note to just have the, uh, the basic uh, data yeah. available. Okay, and then and then on this concept of um, the people that don't want to quit, right? Um, uh, are there? I mean, I I know that oftentimes people they try to make a quit attempt and then it's unsuccessful, and then they're kind of psychologically scarred, you know, from this failure, this quit attempt failure, basically, right? And so then they might square up trying to make another quit attempt for the foreseeable future because of you know the psychological pain of having tried to quit and having failed, right? Um, are there actually people that go through their whole life? never wanting to to quit or are is it are you just really capturing the recently failed people that at that point in time they don't want to quit smoking but maybe you know that's just a temporary thing likely all of the above right i i think yeah i think one of the first uh things that i i, I took uh my old supervisor jody's course uh, was one of the first things i did when i started at yale and i think there's this lovely quote with someone's you know from the public and kind of said, oh quitting's easy i've done it a thousand times i think but i think there's the, the whole literature on, on you know people uh, the dynamics of people's quit attempts and things and for some people it's quite easy other people struggle with it over a number of years some people will sort of you know make a few attempts in batches and then carry on smoking and give up quitting and then try again and things and and, and really, we, we've collected some information on the number of quits in sort of the past year and things, but we don't have a, uh, we haven't collected a, a massive amount of data on people's 
quitting history other than that and and yeah and, and you're right and yeah yeah maybe it'd be interesting to, to sort of model you know how choices would be made as a function of, of quitting history and actually is that you know uh, yeah maybe um is e-cigarette use more popular amongst people that have tried a million times to quit and feel that they can't versus those that that just plainly aren't interested in quitting and things like yeah okay all right thanks Sean. Good. Okay, let's um, let's crack on, shall we? Okay. So, okay, yeah. So let's talk about the model. So we're going to do two things with the model. So the first thing in the modelling is um, we're going to use latent classes. So in latent classes, um, we sort of basically estimate uh, a number of sort of groups that are lying around in the data. Um, so the question is like, well, 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 why do we do that? So the first thing is is preference heterogeneity. So uh, it's a way of accounting for the fact that, you know, we're all different and we all have different tastes and different preferences for things. So the latent class is doing that in a sort of group-wise fashion by defining two classes. They both have sets of parameters and they're different from each other. So group one behave differently from group two, and it's a really convenient way of looking at um, differential behavior in a, in a sum. Um, uh, yeah, and they are kind of our, our policy relevant groups as well. Um, so that can be quite interesting. Um, the, sort of the latent bit of it, it, it comes from the fact that you, you kind of um, sort of let these groups arise naturally from, from the way that you estimate the data. Um, in a sense, it kind of speaks for itself. Uh, and that's quite nice because I don't have to um, sort of impose anything from it. So I could take um, an approach that might stratify the data, say, by gender or by education but in doing so i'm sort of imposing something on the data whereas actually by the latent class model i just let these classes kind of naturally arise um and 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 you know i don't have to make in assumptions or impositions like that um, and also we can take a step further and then we can um, look at the makeup of the, each of those classes according to their individual characteristics so does class a you know they male or female or educated or, or etc etc so it's really useful policy information. So latent class is a nice sort of group-wise behavior. See, what, see what's going on. Uh, latent variable analysis is, is essentially um, a control for COVID. So I'm sure it won't have escaped people's attention that we've had this enormous shock to our whole way of life. Um, and, and kind of we, we were trying to find a way of, of controlling for that. And, and in particular, in, in kind of health behaviors, and how might that impact on smoking behaviours and indeed smoking choices that we're interested in here? So, um, what we've done is um, we collected um, a, a set of questions on individuals' um, kind of health health behaviours in general. So we have smoking, we have drinking, we have exercise, and we have the amount of people sleep. In and all of these were framed in response to the pandemic. Then what we want to do is kind of um, sort of amalgamate those um, and kind of trying to get a view as to how uh, uh, health behaviours have responded collectively in response to the pandemic and that's what we're trying to do by building a latent variable. So we're treating each of those individual indicators as indicators of some sort of underlying health behaviour. We're going to model them together with the latent variable that's going to represent that health behaviour and then we're going to look at how that health behavior or change in that health behavior relate to the choices between uh, cigarettes and e-cigarettes. So we can ask questions like, hey, um, were people in response to the pandemic um, behaving healthier? And if they're behaving healthier, did they choose e-cigarettes more when they might have stuck to smoking or something like that? So that's, that's what the latent variable is doing. Okay, so how are we doing with time? Not bad. So the next few slides, we go through the models. Um, and kind of how we're putting them together and how they how they kind of all work. So here we've got four boxes, and the four boxes represent the four um, uh, things that I observed in the experiment and in the survey. So at the bottom we have the observed choices, and that's the thing we're most interested in. That's going to be the dependent variable for our model. On the left we have our tobacco products and attributes. So that's what we've seen in the experiments and design. So that's the cigarettes and the e-cigarettes, and then the prices and the flavors and the health harms, etc. Uh, above that, we have individual characteristics, so age, gender, ethnicity, and, uh, education, etc. Uh, and then on the right-hand side, we've got these uh, the indicators of the sort of responses, to the the health behaviours, so the COVID-related uh, health behaviours. So the question is, how do all these fit together? 
uh, and in particular, how they all fit together and come together and impact or are, are, are related to the choices. So the first thing we're going to put here are, are latent classes. So again, um, we estimated in the end a, a two latent class model. Um, so what we're saying is that uh, there are two, two sort of subgroups of people in our, in our sample and they're behaving differently. So the question is, well, what do those uh, two sets of behaviours look like uh, in terms of the tobacco products and attributes, in terms of what we gave them in the experiment? Well, um, uh, you know, class one might, let's say, really prefer cigarettes and not like their e-cigarettes. Class two may be indifferent between their cigarettes and e-cigarettes. Uh, class one might, I don't know, be, respond to flavours and class two might be less bothered about flavours or something like that. Essentially, all we're worried about here is that the two sets of behaviours are different, behaving differently in a sort of um, group-wise fashion. Uh, and, and, and we'll see that through the, through the preferences for, for the products and, and the attributes. So the next question is, well, who's in which class and what these, these classes look like? Well, we can do that with our class membership. So we can just estimate which people are in which classes. Well, that's nice, but we can actually go a step further, which is really useful. So actually, we can take individuals uh, the characteristics of the individual and we can feed those into our class membership and now we can look at well how does class membership vary as a function of individual characteristics so are individuals in class one male or female or more educated or etc are individuals in class two male or female or more educated or etc and that's really really useful behavioral information because you can see what types of people are behaving or how their choices are varying um, in, in this sort of group wise fashion so that, that setup as it is there is, is the latent class bit of the model. And yeah, so that's kind of nice and useful. So the next bit is um, the latent variable that we're interested in. So the first thing I'm going to do is define a kind of a, a, a latent variable. And then I'm going to um, define it in terms, of, or I'm going to uh, relate it in terms of these uh, four um, sort of response to COVID health behavior indicators that I've got. So smoking, drinking, exercise, and sleep. So that's going to help me sort of um, uh, sort of define this this latent variable. It's kind of like sort of collectively. It's almost a sort of averaging of those four indicators. So the next thing I'm interested in once I've got this latent variable is again, what does that look like in terms of its individual characteristics? Are people that are behaving healthier or less healthy as a re response to the pandemic? Are they more male or female or education, etc.? So that's what's going to tell me then. And then finally, I'm interested in how that that health behavior response uh, impacts on the class membership and then the class membership how it impacts on choices ultimately. So here we're saying um, are people that were behaved more healthily in response to the pandemic more likely to be in class one or more likely to be in class two and therefore um, what kind of choices they would make. Okay so I hope that's nice and clear so this is going to be the framework as you move forward um, sort of the rest of the, the models and the results as well, just to kind of help us as a bit of a roadmap to see which bits we're doing where. Okay, so very quickly, let's look at some, um, how we estimated this, all these equations. Um, so we're gonna start with the utility function. So utility function will have one of each for each of the latent classes, but both of them look like this. You just have one each for one of the classes. So um, this is the deterministic bit of the, what we call the utility function. And um, these are the features of the experiment that are driving, driving utility. So we have uh, here we have uh, constant terms for um, pod e-cigarette relative to their own cigarette. We have a disposable e-cigarette relative to the smoker's usual cigarette uh, and, a, and a constant of whether or not they were a menthol smoker. Um, then we have the attributes. So the flavor, um, whether or not they were healthier than cigarettes whether or not they're useful as a cessation aid, the amount of nicotine, um, and whether the e-cigarette was cheaper than the usual cigarette or whether the uh, e-cigarette was more expensive than the usual cigarette. Um, yeah, so we're gonna estimate the betas and we're gonna estimate these constant terms. And that's gonna tell us about people's preferences for these things. So the dependent variable again is, is the individual's experimental choices and the independent variables were the, the products and the attributes that were experimentally there. And uh, yeah, so that's this bit of the model. So the next question is, uh, how are we doing for time? Okay, little bit, little bit pushed, Never mind. So the next bit is just the latent classes. So again, we have 
the same utility function here, which is what we defined in the last slide. Um, and then we have one of these each for the two latent classes. So one for latent class one, one for latent class two. So two different sets of parameters. Um, and then we have the class membership probability, which is this chat, this pi here. Uh, and that's telling, again, that's telling us uh, which individuals are in which classes or the proportion of people in, in each of the classes. So of course, the next stage that we're interested in is saying, well, hey, um, can we define this class membership probability in terms of things that we can observe or in terms of the characteristic? And the answer to that is a yes, that's exactly what we can do. So this equation is telling us what this class membership looks like. And we're going to define it as a function of individual characteristics. So these are the Z. Um, and here's my latent variable for the, for the health or response of health behavior to the pandemic. So that's, that's the class membership here. And again, it's, it's a function of these individual characteristics and the latent variable. Um, and again, this is going to tell us what, what these classes look like in terms of their demographics uh, and what, what they look like in terms of uh, the response, the health behavior response to, to the pandemic. Okay, so next um, we are looking at how we define the latent variable or how it relates to our indicators of behavioral change. So taking smoking as an example, so we have, uh, this is just a sort of textbook sort of ordered logit model. So any sort of master's course in stats or econometrics you will have dealt with these. It looks a bit funny because I've got really unnecessarily long uh, uh, names for these variables and I'm sorry about that. But really all we're doing is taking the uh, dependent variable, which is the, the response in the survey question. So for smoking, it was whether the individual smoked more, uh, smoked much more, smoked more, smoked the same, smoked less or smoked much less. So five options, so that's the dependent variable. And the independent variable is the latent variable. So that's telling us the relationship between each of those indicators and the latent variable. And again, that's this bit of the model here. So I'm kind of informing this latent variable as a function of the indicators that I've got of those health behaviors. So whether or not they smoke more, whether or not they drank more, whether or not they exercise more, or whether or not they slept more. Um, and next, of course, we're interested in what we call the structural equation. So what does that latent variable look like in terms of uh, individual characteristics? So did males or females behave more or less healthily as a response to the pandemic? Um, and so we're going to use those again. Um, we're going to use the same individual characteristics here and estimate some uh, parameters on this as well. Okay, uh, and finally, yeah, so this is just a kind of final part where we sort of bring everything together. So we're just gonna sort of stitch everything, all the different model components we just talked about, stitch those together in a, in a log likelihood and, and estimate the whole thing here. So yeah, that's basically what we did. Um, yeah, so I'm quite, again, I'm, I'm a little bit pushed for time. Uh, I am quite happy to talk about these offline. So do email me or do ask questions for one of two reasons. If you're interested in, talking about econometric models, or perhaps you're uh, suffering with insomnia, I will talk at length about those. So anyway, um, just by way of validity, before we move on, we did a few checks um, and a few kind of, uh, just make sure that our, our results were, were robust. And so first of all, we checked our coefficients were in line with theory. So do people prefer cheaper products, things like that. Second of all, um, we did a bit of testing on the utility function specification to arrive at that to begin with. Uh, we removed individuals whose quit, that's a quite interesting, should say quit interest, uh, quit interest was greater than five. So again, we had this variable of zero to 10 of quit interest. We wanted to get individuals only with five or less, but because of sampling difficulties, we extended that to five, it could be above five. Um, so that was 108 individuals out of 2000. So we dropped those and reran the models and the, the uh, estimates were stable. We removed individuals who reported that they didn't answer the questionnaire carefully, which was only, thankfully only five out of 2,000. But again, the models were stable. And sort of reassuringly, uh, most of our sample reported that they answered it really uh, extra carefully. Uh, we used um, more Latin classes to check whether or not the two was the best fit, and two was our preferred specification. And we used mixing distributions within the Latin classes, but again, it didn't materially add to the specification, so we retained this specification. Okay. So finally, once we've got our estimated model, we want to use it to make our policy predictions. And this is where we're really interested from a policy point of view, because it's looking at whether or not, or the, the extent to which these smokers will respond to various policies. So how are we going to do that? The first thing we do is use the model to predict the kind of what we call the state of the world, or the base case scenario. Um, and then we, then we take that, and then we, then we embed as much real world information into that base case as we can. So we use things like 
so um, uh, in the experiment, of course, we varied the prices, but individuals won't face those prices in real world settings. So we can take real world prices and plug them into the model to make our predictions. So we're doing, we're doing things like that. We're kind of embedding some of this real world inf uh, information into our models. The next thing we do is, is uh, what we call calibration. So my base case scenario say X percent of smokers will choose cigarettes and a Y percent will choose e-cigarettes. But I've also asked individuals in the survey whether or not they use e-cigarettes. And if uh, in the survey those two things are different, I can adjust my model so that they become the same. In which case, I'm, I'm, my base case scenario is perfectly predicting the amount of cigarettes and e-cigarettes that individuals in the sample told us they use. So it's, it's predicting reality at that point. And that's good. And again, we're just trying to embed as much realism into, into these predictions as we can. So finally, from that, we use that um, we predict like what if scenarios. So in this case, we're predicting um, sort of tax changes and uh, what would happen if menthol cigarettes were banned. Um, and we use a, a sort of a, a technique called sample enumeration to do that. So essentially, all we're doing for the predictions is using the model that we've predicted and just this orange bit here, we're just embedding some real world data into it to make it as realistic as we can. Okay, um, I'm not going to, I was going to show this, but I'm a, a, we're a little bit short of time, sadly, so I'm going to pass over that. Um, Mike, were there any questions in passing before we move to the results? Uh, no, I think go, uh, proceed, and then I, I know that there's some Q&As um, uh, for you when you're finished. Okay, fantastic. Okay, good. Okay, so in terms of our descriptive statistics, they look like this. Uh, mean age is about 51. Um, uh, slightly under half of a female. Um, uh, yeah, sort of, uh, uh, sort of quite, sort of quite white population. But I think it, you know, in terms of NIQ, I think that's, I think that's, that's quite right, or at least we sampled on that anyway. So it should be. Um, quit interest on average about three point one six, um, with standard deviation of one point eight, and again a maximum eight because we had to relax our, our one to five uh, 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 sampling. Sadly, um, so most were tobacco only smokers. About thirty percent were menthol only smokers, and about eight percent did both. And about 19% of our uh, sample reported dual use. So they were also e-cigarette users as well as uh, smokers. Okay, so latent class models. So let's start with the utility functions and let's start with class one. So we have uh, our estimated coefficients from our experiment and we've labeled this class non-switches. Why have we labeled this class non-switches? Because you can see really strong negative utility for both of those e-cigarette products. What does that mean? That means relative to their own cigarettes, um, they really don't like either kind of e-cigarette. And as a result, it means that they're not, their choices aren't going to be responsive to any of the attributes that we've estimated preferences for. So they're non-switches, because even if you make e-cigarettes as appealing as you can in terms of prices, in terms of whether or not they can help you quit or nicotine levels, they're not going to change their, their choices. Um, so these are the other estimated coefficients for um, the other attributes as well. So um, individuals prefer cheaper products. Individuals dislike more expensive products. Um, weren't interested, or sorry, it was uh, whether or not it helps you quit is a sort of negative property. But if these are smokers that don't want to quit, presumably that makes sense because they don't want to quit. So something that does help you quit is, is, is a bad thing. Um, dislike whether or not it was help, considered healthier. Um, and again, I think we, we, we're interpreting this as a sort of um, almost a sort of low fat or alcohol free um, sort of beer type, type um, setup. But I'm happy to talk about interpretation of these parameters as well at any point. Um, and again, nicotine, not positive preferences for lower levels of nicotine in e cigarettes uh, and negative preferences for flavors in e-cigarettes as well. Okay, so just to kind of summarize, uh, so non-switches, and this was 68% of the sample, by the way, so most of the samples, or the, the large majority, were these, were these non-switches. But yeah, so their product choices were unresponsive to, to the attributes. Um, and yeah, preferred cheaper products, um, dislike the, the cessation aid and healthiness, and uh, preferred lower nicotine uh, to their own. Okay. Class two, so these were the switches. Again, why are we calling them switches? Because certainly for the pod e-cigarette, 
um, it was only slightly negative, but not statistically significantly different from zero, meaning that these uh, or individuals in the, these smokers were indifferent between poly cigarettes and their own cigarette. Slightly negative uh, coefficient and significant on disposable e-cigarettes, so they slightly preferred their own cigarette to, um, to disposable e-cigarettes, uh, but were um, uh, but to a much less extent than, than for the non-switchers. So, so these individuals' choices were amenable to variation in attributes in favour of e-cigarettes and, and therefore could be uh, uh, shifted. And as a consequence, we've sort of named them uh, um, switchers. So similar pattern of uh, preferences here in this group. So again, uh, preferred cheaper products, disliked expensive products, um, not significant on whether or not it helped them quit or whether or not they were healthier. Um, preferred lower levels of nicotine, but to a lower extent than the, the, the non-switches and disliked uh, fruit flavours in e-cigarettes as well. Okay, so again, 32% of the sample and we've just summarised what we said there. Okay, so what about um, class membership probability? So what does class one and class two look like in terms of their individual characteristics? Well, class one on average were ever so slightly older, were less likely to have undergone higher education, were on lower income on average, uh, and were less likely to be uh, black or Asian. They were less likely to be a dual user um, and had a higher score on the, on the latent variable. So what we're seeing here is that individuals that really preferred their own cigarettes uh, tended on average uh, to be older, lower education, lower income, and white, which I think is in keeping broadly with, with um, you know, observed statistics on those things as well. Bear in mind, we had no effect of whether or not individuals have had COVID on class membership probability. So whether or not you've had COVID didn't impact on whether or not you had your preferences for, for um, cigarettes and e-cigarettes. And finally, the latent variable will come back to you. This is positively related to class membership. So individuals that scored higher on the latent variable were more likely to be in class one. And we'll come back to that in the next few slides, put a bit more um, meat on those bones. So that, yeah, that slide summarizes what we've just seen. Um, this is the latent variable. And again, um, what we're focusing on here are the zeta coefficients. So basically all these are saying are um, individuals that scored higher on the latent variable smoked less, individuals that scored higher on the latent variable drank less, and individuals that scored higher on the latent variable exercise more. No effect on sleep. So it looks like the latent variable is reflecting a sort of healthier. So if you are a higher score on the latent variable, your behaviors are healthier. So what does that mean? Somewhat uh, interestingly, I think, uh, in some non-switchers exhibited healthier behaviours. So they were less likely to switch to e-cigarettes, but at the same time had healthier behaviours overall. So they smoked less and they drank less and they uh, exercised more. Okay, so in terms of uh, our structural equation, so what does the latent variable look like in terms of its, its demographics? Not very much here, only to say that you're less likely to be female, which meant that um, males on average scored higher on the, on the latent variable um, and really what this is telling us is about the mechanisms of heterogeneity or the, sorry, the mechanisms of individual characteristics um, and how they relate to choices so most of the variation in choices according to individual characteristics is coming through class membership probability rather than through the latent variable and then through class membership so telling us about the mechanisms of what's happening there Okay, so that's the kind of technical bit done. So now we're on to the policy simulations. And this is where I think we get interested as, as a kind of um, a from a policy point of view. So here we have our baseline characteristics that we calibrated and talked about. And then we've made two predictions from that. So first of all, what happens if we ban menthol cigarettes? And second of all, what happens if we increase uh, cigarette taxes by, by 50%? So put the price at 50%. So over here we have our three classes and um, we have class one which were our non-switches, class two which were our switches and then the total which is the weighted average of those two. Um, what we're seeing here is the market share of each of the products in each of those classes and then we're seeing how that changed for each of the two predicted scenarios. So what we're interested in here are the highlighted uh, boxes. So that's telling us to begin with, 
um, class two that were the switches um, they had about 56 percent of the of the choice shares in that class were for cigarettes then if we were to ban menthol cigarettes in that group that would drop down to about 0.55 and if we were to increase cigarette tax in that group that would drop down to about 0.53 um, so not very much overall. Uh, our non-switchers, of course, are not switching because that's what we saw in the model and that's what we're seeing in behaviour. So overall, our total um, of, in total in the sample, about 86% of the choices were for cigarettes. And under the two different uh, policy scenarios, that's dropping down to about 85%. So not very much, sadly, is happening. As well. Okay, so key findings. Only switchers were responsive to the policies. Uh, more effect through prices than through menthol. Um, disposable e-cigarettes gained a little bit more share than the poly cigarettes, but both policies had limited impact um, and very few choices were, were sort of taken away from, from cigarettes. Okay, so let's just wrap up in a few slides and then I think we'll open it up to, to some questions. Um, so in summary, we used a, a choice experiment to look at uh, smokers that were not uh, interested in quizzing, their product preferences. Um, so we asked uh, whether or not or the extent to which they could be encouraged away from their own cigarettes and, uh, towards, towards either pod or disposable e-cigarettes um, and, and, and asked that question by simulating the potential impacts um, of FDA or, or other policy tax, um, uh, other policies. So our findings overall, so we found two classes of smokers, so some who were amenable to switching and some who weren't. Um, our non-switchers choices didn't appear to be uh, uh, impacted at all. Our switchers' choices were responsive, but to very limited degree. Um, but, but having said that, these switchers nonetheless were sort of younger, um, educated, um, black, Asian, and users of e-cigarettes uh, anyway. So just a couple of discussion points, I think, to end on. Um, so switchers were the only group that were likely to be res uh, um, uh, responsive to these policy attributes. So if policy attention is going to be given, it suggests that perhaps policy focus should be placed there. Um, the finding that e-cigarette flavours didn't impact on choices didn't seem to have any implications for this um, population of smokers, but it might be good in a wider regulatory picture if you're thinking of, well, do I want to prevent youth use through banning flavours? Well, actually, if you, at the same time, if you're not discouraging these really, really at-risk smokers from transitioning away from a harmful product, then that's a good thing. Similar story with nicotine. If I want to lower nicotine in cigarettes, it doesn't look like that's going to have any impact on the choices of these at-harm cigarette, uh, that these at-harm smokers. In which case, that's less of a concern of mine if I'm also at the same time hoping to protect youth through um, through policy. So just to end on, um, so yeah, prices only had a marginal impact on choices anyway, and I guess the TK, excuse me, the key take-home. None of these policy studies appear to impact on these smokers' short-term choices. Um, so other policies might be used um, if we really want to kind of um, impact on these, on these choices a little bit more as well. So yeah, so that was all I wanted to say. Um, thank you very much for listening. I'm sorry I've gone over or I've left enough time, but anyway, sorry. Any questions would be, would be wonderful. Um, so Mike, do you have any questions? I will just defer to the Q&A um, to make sure that we get those questions answered. Okay, so um, I think there is a question um, regarding the, uh, let me see, the uh, concern that, is there any concern that encouraging people who are five out of 10 on the intention to quit cigarettes skill toward e-cigarettes would reduce their overall likelihood to quit, quit nicotine use entirely? It seems to me that five out of 10 is halfway to a quit attempt rather than an expression of no intention to quit. So this is a question regarding your sample and uh, how you would view the alternative to quitting, uh, I mean, alternative to using e-cigarettes. Uh, there is also the alternative to quitting smoking or tobacco, nicotine tobacco products altogether. I believe that's a question. Um, yeah, absolutely. There's a, there's there's a risk of of you know if there are individuals that did have the potential to quit and were in a sense prevented from doing that by switching, then then of course that's that that that's an I guess an obvious risk and, and well pointed out actually. And the the choice of it, it was difficult, I think, to um, 
uh, come up with a choice of of a threshold on that scale to use to to from which to sample and it's a balance of a number of things it's one it's it's trying to think well how do people interpret that scale and and frankly you know five being halfway on that to us was suggestive of, of below that not really being interested or somewhat the other concern was well um, in terms of sampling, it's much harder to get people if you lower and lower that threshold. So if we'd have just used zero, it would have been much harder to get a population. And in fact, even when we did use five, we still couldn't fill a, a population entirely and get it. Um, and the third thing was, um, in terms of trying to derive quotas from path, because the numbers were really low, particularly when we split out across the groups of interest, it was actually hard to find any sort of number of individuals when we did... Um, compute some 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 quotas uh, when we looked at uh, you know either one or two or something so so for a number of reasons we chose five but but they were partially driven by pragmatism um and it you know and we we did kind of struggle i think to to um to take a view as to whether or not it was truly reflective of this not interested in quitting um and behavior so so yeah some some good points well well taken um yeah, so here is a related question from Ken Warner. What were the average interest in quitting scores of the two classes if they were significantly different um, with the switcher having higher scores on the 10-point scale? What have you gained through the class analysis? Uh, same kind of question wrapping the two classes since he reported that individual characteristics were more important. So... Uh, yeah, a really good question. So I, uh, yeah, uh, I don't know. Cause, uh, yeah, because we haven't looked, but that would be uh, a very good thing to compute. So just, just I guess on a slightly technical note, and probably I haven't explained it very well, but um, class membership probability is, is probabilistic. So everybody in the sample is up to a probability included in both classes. So you're not either in one or the other, you're in both up to a probability, which means that um, sort of... Uh, the average, the average uh, quit interest in each of those classes isn't entirely clear. But if we could back out of the model somewhere, and I think that's a really interesting thing to look at, and we will certainly do that. So yeah, thank you for your suggestion. Yeah, I think we are out of time. There are a lot of questions in the Q&A. Thanks for this. Um, and I think uh, we will send all the questions to John, and you can answer your questions. Uh, you can answer your questions individually. Um, I think I'll pass this to Catherine and then we can, um, you know, have this uh, great presentation concluded. Thank you all. Thank you, C. Um, we are out of time. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bucko, for the presentation and to the moderator and discussants. Finally, thank you to the audience of 110 people for your participation. Our next seminar speaker will be Rahi Abouk, presenting, giving a presentation on April 29th titled Impact of Tobacco 21 on Cigarette and E-Cigarette Use Among Adolescents. After leaving the seminar, you will have an opportunity to complete a survey on your satisfaction with the seminar today. We appreciate the feedback. You will also receive an email with instructions for how you can receive a certificate for your attendance today. Thanks again for participating and have a top-notch weekend.